Little do we realize that when we dial a handful of digits and hear a voice from Tokyo, Paris, London or Washington as clearly as if it were in the next room that we owe it to the man sitting on this platform with us today. The television screen in our living room flashes a picture of President J.R. Jawadana in a friendly conversation with Prime Minister Rajiv Gandhi in faraway Bahamas. The Queen of England inspects a guard of honor at Horse Guards Parade. The Pope blesses the crowds in Vatican Square. The last five wickets of the Aussies collapse for only five runs at Adelaide. In 1965, 20 years after the publication of his paper, the first communication satellite, Early Bird, was launched. Today, ladies and gentlemen, we are celebrating the twin anniversaries, 40 years of the publication of Dr. Clark's first paper on ComSat and the 20th year of the Early Bird satellite. It is given to few men to make the kind of impact that Dr. Clark has made on a vast segment of humanity by the publication of a single paper, the promotion of a single idea. We may recall other such cases. For example, the structure of the double helix by Watson and Crick, their publication of a paper in 1953 revolutionized molecular biology. The paper explaining the photoelectric effect by Einstein in 1906 gave rise to the development of the new concepts of quantum science. The transistor of Shockley, the restriction enzymes of Seymour and Cohn may perhaps be in the same category. The man we celebrate today is Dr. Arthur C. Clarke. This name is a household word in the world's literature. Dr. Clarke is an Englishman by birth, but a citizen of the cosmos by choice, a resident of Sri Lanka for the last 30 years. After a first-class honours in physics at King's College, London, 
and a brief stint at the Institute of Electrical Engineers, the call of the Great Barrier Reef led him by way of the pearl of the Indian Ocean. It was love at first sight. Sri Lanka became home to the greatest mind of science fiction the world has ever known. While his writings have titillated the imagination of young and old, his uncanny insight as a scientist has led to some of the most widespread benefits for all mankind. This paper, which we celebrate today in the wireless world of 1945, is one such example. The recognition for his work is universal. His awards and honors are legion. What is most important to us is that he has thrown in his lot with us. There is no fitting tribute to him than the setting up of the Arthur C. Clarke Center for Modern Technologies. Like a magnet, his name has drawn to our center the interest and the support of scientific and world organizations. He is the patron of the Institute. This center was set up in Sri Lanka with the definite goal of moving the country towards the very frontiers of science and development. It goes back in concept to a proposal which first surfaced in the international context at the 21st session of the UNESCO General Conference held in Belgrade in the year 1980. The General Conference was convinced of the need and importance of developing technical capabilities at their very forefront in developing communities. The new technologies are drawn from an entirely new scientific base. They have little resemblance to the science that engineers and scientists learned barely a decade ago. Today, one deals with phenomena which were inconceivable in the Newtonian world of classical theory or even in the atomic age. New industries are arising out of wave mechanics and quantum electronics. We would fail in our duty if we let an occasion such as this pass without applying the lesson of this celebration to Sri Lanka. Your Excellency, in a now classic speech made at the convocation of Sri Jayawardenepura University on February 16, 1984, made a clarion call to the nation to leapfrog into the 21st century. This policy of science and technology for development announced by a head of state of a developing nation has had a major effect on the think tanks of development and policy for the third world. Today we are celebrating the 40th anniversary of the day when he wrote about communication satellites, commonly known as ComSat. We are also celebrating the day he was born. I do not know exactly how old he is, that's a matter for him to tell you, but today is the day that he was born. These two celebrations are matters of interest and pride to the people of Sri Lanka because Mr. Arthur C. Clarke has decided to make Sri Lanka his home. We honor him as a fellow citizen, we respect him as a great writer, and we regard him as one of those who led the way in discoveries to, to the future world of telecommunication. Ladies and gentlemen, may I on your behalf wish Arthur Clarke many more years of happiness and wish him a happy birthday today. If you can all rise up, I do not know whether you can sing, but all repeat together, happy birthday, dear Arthur. Happy birthday, dear Arthur. I suppose I should begin with the obligatory historical summary, but I'll get to that as quickly as possible. I'm always asked, how did you get this idea? Well, in 1945, I was a Royal Air Force officer, 
stationed at a small airfield at a very inspirational place, strapped on Avon. And you won't be surprised to know that I began my, I began selling my science fiction there. I was also involved with the British Interplanetary Society, a group of crazy characters who before the war thought we might better go to the moon. We had been scattered during the war years, but we kept in touch. My <clears throat> very peaceful Air Force career was spent in radar training centers, and in 1945 I was in charge of the first, probably the most advanced, three centimeter microwave radar system in the world, GCA, Grand Control Approach, which used to talk down uh, aircraft in bad visibility. And that, in fact, forms the theme of my only non-science fiction novel, uh, Glide Path. Well, the war was obviously coming to an end, and we were thinking about ways of getting the interplanetary movement again. It seemed inconceivable to us that anyone, any government would ever pay for such a crazy idea as space travel. So we we're trying to think of ways in which rockets could earn an honest living instead of blowing people up. And so the combination of microwave radar and theory of rocketry sort of melded together in my mind. And early in 45, the idea of the communication satellites gelled. And it was obvious to me <clears throat> that the place to put them, to put these extraterrestrial relays in the specific orbit at such a height, the satellite took exactly 24 hours to go around the world. And therefore, if it was above the equator, it would stay apparently poised over the same spot on the equator, the so-called geostationary orbit. And uh, I wrote this up as a short memorandum, which you will see, five, uh, six pages of typing. The original is in the Smithsonian. It's a very good replica in the exhibition. A few months later, I wrote the article, which was published in Wireless World, and which you will see in your brochure. And then nothing much happened for a few years, about 10, in fact. And uh, my friend John Pierce Wrote a, wrote a more technical paper on the same idea, probably in 1955, and then in 1965, Early Bird was launched, and, and things happened very rapidly. I'd been asked if anybody laughed at the idea when the paper was published, but in fact they didn't, because in 1945, October, we had seen the atomic bomb and the V-2 rocket. So an idea which would have been laughed at maybe a couple of years earlier uh, was now taken quite seriously, the only question was well, whether this is worth doing, if so, in what time scale would it be? I was right out, I was completely wrong about the time scale. I thought we would not have communication satellites until around the end of the century. Uh, because, of course, in 1945, electronic equipment depended on the radio valve or tube. Remember them? and the incredible developments falling from the transistor still lay in the future. So I imagined that these relays would have to be large manned platforms because we had now the day in our fairly simple radar set, with only less than a thousand valves in it. Pretty complicated in those days, but now of course very small indeed. So I imagine we'd have to have manned space stations with permanent crews. And I envisaged three of them, around, one over the Pacific, one over the Atlantic, one over the Indian Ocean. And interestingly enough, we are now coming back to that concept of very large antenna farms, not, not manned, but visited and serviced from time to time. Well, instead of three manned space platforms, we now have a necklace of small satellites right around the equator. And we have, in fact, a traffic problem, not of collisions, but of preventing interference with the various frequencies. Um, the spacing at the moment, the minimum spacing is about three degrees, which would allow 120 satellites around the equatorial arc. 
Now they're reducing that to two degrees and trying all sorts of fancy tricks. And then we do have this necklace of satellites around the planet, although it's much denser over the continental United States than it is at the moment over the Pacific, where there, of course, are not so many customers. Let me uh, give you some idea of how these satellites work. Your local radio, the ordinary AM band, is concerned with frequencies of about a million cycles a second, one megahertz. Uh, the FM band, television band, 100 million, 100 megahertz, up to 200 megahertz. But the most popular band for communication satellites is 4,000 megahertz. 20 times the frequency of your local TV station. And we have to go to such high frequencies or to such short wavelengths so we can get very accurately focused beams. As uh, Dr. Panam Puruma mentioned, the first satellites were very low powered and they needed very large receiving dishes of which the one at Paducah is probably familiar to most of you. 90 feet in diameter and costing millions of dollars. But with increasing power, it became possible to receive satellite television with smaller and smaller ground dishes. And the Indian government, the in, uh, Space Research Organization India, carried out the first big experiment in this area with its site satellite instructional television. But the higher the frequency, or the shorter the wavelength, the smaller the dish you can get away with. And now there's another revolution taking place in communication satellites. As we move from the 4,000 megahertz down to, or up to, 11 or 12,000 megahertz, using wavelengths only about that long. And as a result, we can get away with dishes less than a yard across and they're going to spring up like mushrooms all over the world. And in fact, ground stations for the K-band, as it's called, have just crashed through the $1,000 barrier. And that is a thought when you consider that only a decade ago it cost millions. Now they're under $1,000. And getting more and more portable. In fact, there's a complete Earth station, not only for receiving, but for transmitting, which can be now carried in two suitcases. And they rushed the first prototype to, to Mexico. Technically, as far as the engineering aspects of the matter are concerned, we can now do anything we want to. The limitations are financial and political. <clears throat> the technical limits are set only by our imagination. And now I'd like to look a little bit into the future. But one way of doing that is first by going into the past. In the closing decade of the 19th century, an electrical engineer, Dr. Ayrton, was lecturing at London's Imperial Institute about the most modern communications devices of that time, the submarine telegraph cable. And incidentally, I have with me here a rather interesting historical souvenir this is a piece of the very first Atlantic submarine cable, 1858. It only worked for a few days and very badly, and was able to transmit maybe a word a minute, something of that order. And then it failed, and it didn't get a working one until 1865. But this was the Apollo project of the Victorian era, and it was the first linkage of the new world and the old by telecommunications. This lecture by Dr. Ayrton ended with what, at that time, when this was high technology, must have seemed the wildest fantasy. 
There is no doubt that the day will come when a person wants to telegraph a friend, he knows not where, he will call in an electromagnetic voice, which shall be heard loud by him who has the electromagnetic ear, but will be silent to everyone else. He will call, where are you? And the reply will come, I am at the bottom of the coal mine, or crossing the Andes, or in the middle of the Pacific. Or perhaps no reply will come at all, and he may then conclude that his friend is dead. This truly astonishing prophecy was made in 1897, long before anyone could imagine how it could be fulfilled. A century later, by 1997, it will be on the verge of achievement, because the wristwatch use. And if you still believe that such a device is unlikely, ask yourself this question. Who could have imagined the personal wristwatch back in the Middle Ages when the only clocks were clanking room-sized mechanisms, the pride and joy of a few cathedrals? For that matter, many of you now carry on your wrists miracles of electronics that would have been beyond belief even 20 years ago. Now, the political and social and economic implications of the communication satellites have now been the subject of countless books and seminars. And I'd like to quote briefly from an address I made at the United Nations on World Telecommunications Day, 17 May 83. And I hope to show you a bit of the concluding remarks on the monitors if all goes, not, not, not yet, not yet, hold it, if all goes well. And incidentally, I made, the, as I say, I made this speech in May 83. Any resemblance to current events is purely coincidental. During the coming decade, more and more businessmen, well-heeled tourists, and virtually all news persons will be carrying attache case size units which will permit direct two-way communications with their homes or offices via the most convenient satellite. These will provide voice, telex, and video facilities, still photos, and for those who need it, live TV coverage. As these units become cheaper, smaller, and more universal, they will make travelers totally independent of national communication systems. The implications of this are profound, and not only to media news gatherers, who will no longer be at the mercy of censors or inefficient, sometimes non-existent, postal and telegraph services. It means the end of closed societies and will lead ultimately, to repeat a phrase I heard Arnold Toynbee use 40 years ago, to the unification of the world. You may think this is a naive prediction because many countries wouldn't let sub such subversive machines across their borders, but they will have no choice. The alternative would be economic suicide because very soon they will get no tourists and no businessmen offering foreign currency. They'd get only spies who'd have no trouble in concealing the powerful new tools of their ancient trade. What I am saying, in fact, is that the debate about the free flow of information, which has been going on for so many years, will soon be settled by engineers, not politicians, just as physicists, not generals, have now determined the nature of war. Consider what this means. No government will be able to conceal, at least for very long, evidence of crimes or atrocities, even from its own people, the very existence of the myriads of new information channels operating in real time and across all frontiers will be a powerful influence for civilized behavior. If you are arranging a massacre, it will be useless to shoot the cameraman who has so inconveniently appeared on the scene. His pictures will already be safe in the studio 5,000 kilometers away, and his final image may hang you. Many governments will not be at all happy about this, but in the long run, everyone will benefit. Exposures of scandals or political abuses, especially by visiting TV teams who go home and make rude documentaries, can be painful, but also very valuable. Many a ruler might still be in power today had he known what was really happening in his own country. 
The wise statesman once said, in fact, Taj, you may have written this, a free press can give you hell, but it can save your skin. This is even more true of TV reporting, which, thanks to satellites, will soon be instantaneous and ubiquitous. Let us hope that it will also, that it will also be responsible. Considering what has so often happened in the past, optimism here may well be tempered with concern. Well, that's the end of my quotation from the, at the UN. And I say, uh, President, I want to show you the finale on the, on the monitors. But before I do that, I'd like to conclude this live portion of my speech with an address I made just over a year ago <clears throat> at the Vatican to the Pontifical Academy of Science. Uh, I don't expect to be invited back because I told them my favorite Polish joke. During the last decade, something new has come into the world. Two-dimensional networks are replacing vertical chains of command in which orders moved downwards and only acknowledgments went upwards. We are witnessing the rise of the global family, or tribe, if you like. Its electronically linked members will be scattered across the face of the planet, and its loyalties and interests will transcend all the ancient frontiers. Those frontiers which are so conspicuously absent in the photographs from space. Those frontiers which to call sacred in the age of thermonuclear weapons is no longer patriotism, but blasphemy. It has been wisely said that the state has now become too big for men, but too small for mankind.
the phone up. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. So you can now imagine that we are talking over a telephone line, right? Now, if I say to you, I'm going to send you a picture. So I push this button here. We can't speak anymore. But what you can do is push that button, and you will receive a picture over here. Can you excuse me one moment? You can put that down for a moment. No, don't hang up. Just put it there. And there's your picture. As you see, it's only a little small picture. So if you push the talk button, push the button mark talk. Now that one there. That's it. Now speak again. All right. So we can speak over the line again. And I'll say, all right, I'll send you a better quality picture. So I push this. Now you push the blue active. You see the button marked active? That's it. Now you're receiving a better quality picture. So this machine has been developed at British Telecom's research laboratory to allow telephone engineers in the field to joint cables together. As you can see in this device here, the fibre is placed in a, a long little groove and held down by these clamps. And if you look down the microscope there, please look, you can see the two fibres jointed, butted end to end along the groove. Can you see that? Oh, hang on, we've switched off. Try again. There you go. You can see? Perpendicular to the fibre, you can see two Vs. Those are electrodes. And what happens is an arc of electricity is passed across those electrodes, a very high DC voltage. And the, the arc of electricity melts the end of the cables and fuses them together. And that allows the light to be transmitted through the joint. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, Arthur C. Clarke is truly a man of vision, a man who obviously looks to the future. There are few fields of human endeavour in which one can focus on a single person's idea as being the start of it all. In the field of satellite communications is one of them. And the man who started it all, the man whose creative thinking and endeavours have gained him worldwide recognition as the father of satellite communications is, of course, Arthur C. Clarke. It was 40 years ago that Arthur first described the principles of communications using geostationary satellites in his famous article, Extra Terrestrial Relays, published in Wireless World. 20 years later, in 1965, the launch of the world's first commercial satellite, Early Bird, marked the beginning of a new era in global communications, an era that has brought so many benefits to mankind. Telecommunications are the infrastructure upon which the economic viability of our nations depend. They are the lifelines which support the fabric of society across the globe. They turn the wheels of commerce for banks, airlines, stock markets, and a host of other business people all over the world. They support our most vital social services, from schools to universities, from clinics to hospitals. Wealth, health, and social harmony are all enhanced by communication. There are few people in the world today whose lives are not influenced in some way by satellite communications. East and West, North and South, we all depend upon our telephones, telexes, radio and television. Satellite communications have truly brought our nations closer together and made the world a better place in which to live. It is thus with great pleasure that British Telecom, as one of the world's major providers of international satellite communication services, can in a small way pay tribute to the man who started it all. On behalf of the Chairman and Directors of British Telecom, I therefore have great pleasure in making this presentation of this orrery clock to Arthur C. Clarke on the occasion of this commemorative communications exhibition in recognition of his notable achievements and his contribution to global satellite communication.
really is beautiful. And I can't think of anything more appropriate, though I don't see Halley's Comet. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, will, we, will explain, we will explain the technicalities of it. I, it's beautiful, magnificent, and I, I, sh I should mention, I you reminded me, that some of the background of this, in fact, I was in the post, my, all my family are post office people, and I used to be the telephone operator, the night operator, Bishop Lidger, in my school days. And, uh, there, there, is, there, is, there is one more thing, Arthur, because today also is another very happy day, and uh, again, from the sort of British Telecom, happy birthday, Arthur. Yeah. By a strange, incredible bridge, it's the 60th anniversary of Radio Salam. So, I mean, this is quite a, 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 a triple coincidence. Thank you. And could I ask, please, uh, if, Mr., uh, if Mrs. Gunnar Warden could please step forward? Mrs. Gunnar Warden.